You want to start, Amy? Yes. All right. I'm just waiting until all the people on the list are in. So hello, everyone. My name is Amy Gantman, and I'm the director of Brentwood Arts Center. I thank you and welcome you to our virtual auditorium for BAC's Conversations on Art series mm -hmm. with our host, Meg Linton, and guest artist, Tom Nectal. Now, in case you don't know yet, I'm pleased to share with you today that BAC has a new physical space to call its home. The new center is located at 1625 Olympic Boulevard in Santa Monica. And I'd like to invite each and every one of you to come join us this fall for an incredible lineup of in-person visual arts programming. Our new campus boasts eight flexible classroom studios, ample parking, and proximity to other arts organizations. BAC's success is due to our incredible and generous board of directors, leadership council, donors, staff, faculty, and students who support the BAC through thick and through thin. And I thank our anonymous donor who has made this series possible again for the next 12 months. We can only do all that we do because of our generous donors who believe everyone should have access to the arts and to education. Now to the meat of the matter. Our host, Meg Linton, and I met at Otis College of Art and Design when Meg was the director of exhibitions for the Ben Maltz Gallery, and I was the dean of continuing education. Our divisions collaborated on many public programs, and we are thrilled to bring Meg's love and respect for artists to BAC. Meg has been visiting artist studios for well over 20 years in her various roles as a director and curator of contemporary art spaces in Southern California. Currently, Meg is lead producer on a documentary film about feminist performance art in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 80s called Acting Like Women, directed by Sherry Galky. She is working on an exhibition about the artist Keith Julius Puccinelli that opens in September of 2024 at UC Santa Barbara. She's writing a novel and of course, conversing with Tom Nectal for the BSC this afternoon. I'd like to welcome Meg. Amy, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to the BAC and our anonymous donor and to everyone working behind the scenes who make this program possible. We are in the August big moon part of the summer and I hope everyone is managing the heat, having some fun and staying hydrated. So welcome to Conversations on Art and our virtual studio visit with Tom Nectal. Um, before I introduce our guest, I have the usual housekeeping. We are recording today's presentation and we ask that you, you know, please mute your microphones and turn off your video. It's not that we don't wanna see your beautiful faces, but it helps with any feedback, um, negative feedback. <laughs> During the conversation, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat and I will either work them into the discussion or ask them at the end. In the chat box, you'll also see that we've put some additional information about our guests for you to peruse on your own, as well instructions on how to save that as a file um, if you want to. Um, so to, to the program at hand, Tom Nectal is a significant figure in the Los Angeles art community and a true native California, originally from Palo Alto. He is a remarkable scholar, teacher, writer, arts advocate, and today we get to spend an hour with him as an artist. I wanna read a quote from an art forum review Christopher Miles wrote in 2002. The opening sentence goes like this. Tom Nectal knows how to load up a picture, but he also knows how to pare it down and in cobbling together the intricate, ornate, and flamboyant, as well as the loose, minimal, and austere, the artist produces what ought to be a visual train wreck, but instead, are carnivalesque ballets apparently choreographed on the fly. Well, none of Tom's images are done on the fly as he is also part of an elite group of artists known as SPIT, which stands for slow painters in town. In today's conversation, we'll see how painstakingly thoughtful and considered Tom's approaches to art making and living an artful life are. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. 
Yeah. So we're going to just launch in and start okay. with some images um, from your studio. Yeah, I thought it would be interesting to to make this talk a little bit more about how the work integrates into my life. So these, I have a studio behind our house. It's a converted garage. And this has been my studio for the last 25 years. So it gives you some idea also of the scale of the drawings that I'll be showing you. I remember when you moved into this studio. Oh, I know. It's you were very biggest, happy because you were working in a very tiny place. I know. This is this is the biggest, best studio I've ever had. I'm very, very happy. And I love, and I also love working close to my home. I, I'm happier being, sort of having my home life and my studio life integrated like this. So do you have like a set routine? I, well, I retired from teaching a couple of years ago. And so what I love is that now... I can work every day, but I don't work like eight hours a day. I work a few hours and then I can go do stuff in the house. I can cook, I can read, I can do other. It's a much more integrated life. I used to have to be extremely disciplined because I worked at the LA Weekly for 25 years while I was teaching and I was helping my late husband raise his daughter. And mm -hmm. so it was a very crowded life and I had to be very disciplined to get my work done. The walls are mostly here hung with work by friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of books. Which I is have a lot of this is the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a close up of there's there's two a couple of workplaces that I have. This is one of the workplaces in the studio. So um, lots of imagery from lots of different sources all piled together. So does this wall kind of change as you work on oh, different yeah. things? Yeah. Well, it, it it changes as things come and go. Some new piece of art comes in and everything gets rearranged. And it also, for a long time, was a, I, I could have the studio be a nicely crowded space, whereas my husband was a little bit allergic to some of this kind of crowding, which most uh -huh. people are allergic to this kind <laughs> of crowding. So I could do it in the studio. Oh, nice. If he, if, if Bob never, like Bob, Bob was sort of queasy about the Dan McCleary nude that's in the upper right. And if he, if I brought something into the house, he wasn't sure about, he'd always say in a cheerful voice, maybe you could put that in your studio. Oh, nice. <laughs> this is so positive. <laughs> and these are just some installation talks of a recent show you had earlier this year at PPOW. Right. And this is a show, I'll, I'll show you some of the work from this. The show was called Drawn After Life. And they were paintings that were about my husband, Rabbi Bob Baruch, and what happened when he passed away from Parkinson's and the whole trajectory of that. So, mm -hmm. so this again, this gives you some idea of the scale of the paintings. The paintings are not um, large by art world standards. They're pretty modest in terms of their scale. And this is normal. This is kind of an average scale for you. You've done yes. some larger, but this is kind of the range you work in. Yeah, it is. It is. I've never done really giant paintings. Um, right. Most of my scale is pretty intimate. And that, you know, and that works. My frame of references are often things like reading, you know, uh, toy theaters, puppet theater, you know, so I, my frame of reference is also an intimate frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And you like miniature books. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I refrain from showing any images of those or that we'd really be going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, exactly. And the rabbit hole is an appropriate yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's true. It is. It is. So oh. you often have self-portraits in your work. You know, well, this part of your groupings, but this is an interesting place to start. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was interesting hearing the Christopher Miles quote that you started with. There was a point in about 2011 where I decided that I needed to turn away from the kind of overloaded circus-like pictures I was making, mm -hmm. that they were not uh, serving their purpose. And I had to kind of find a way into surprising myself in my work. Mm -hmm. And I decided to do something I had never done, which is to draw from life. Um, I went to CalArts in the early 70s mm -hmm. and we didn't have life drawing there and so I I never learned how to draw from life I'd never drawn myself looking in a mirror and learning how to 
to do that kind of was very destabilizing, made me very anxious, all of which is good, and led it actually led into the work that I ended up doing that was about Bob. I find that fascinating that you never did self-portraits earlier on. I, I There were self-portraits that appeared in some of the paintings that you talked about, but I'd never done the thing, you know, the thing that most people do when they're younger, they, you know, do a drawing looking in the mirror. I'd never done that. Oh, wow. And And I needed to do stuff where I really could not tell what I was doing and I couldn't tell if it was good or not. The, the, during the whole first two years of, of drawing from life, I made rules that I had I had to finish everything I started. I couldn't throw anything away. And I, you know, I, I couldn't erase or anything like that. So I drew with right. ink. And it was all a way of kind of flushing myself out into new territory. And allowing myself to make stuff that I thought was terrible, and a lot of it was terrible, but that was the only way I was going to get to something new, was to do something that I really didn't know how to control or what it was. So when you when you say you had to finish it, did you have to finish it in that session, or could you go back to it? I could go back, but the main okay. thing was I wanted to not, you know, you when you're trying something new and you don't know how to do it, it's very easy to be hypercritical and be telling yourself yes. how terrible it is, and you crumple it up and throw it out. But the only way to get to something new is to be willing to do some stuff that's really bad, and also, it's very helpful later to be able to look at what you did. And you, a lot of times you can see that what you did looked terrible to you, but there were actually all these seeds in it of what you needed to unpack. And you can only see that if you keep the things so that you look at it. So I just, I just recently started going through the work now is 10 years old, I think. So I started going back and tearing up stuff. So Wow. Yeah, it's really, it's hard to keep that beginner's mindset. This is a drawing of Bob that I did. So at first I only drew me and Bob. I drew my parents too. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky because Bob and my parents were, were very loving and they basically did not ask to see what I was doing. So I felt like I was in this kind of bubble of privacy. I could just work and see where I'd go. So I wasn't drawing like models, like hiring a model. I was drawing the people around me and the people I loved and you know, seeing what would happen. And this is a drawing I did. We Bob and I lived in Berlin for about four months in 2015. And this was, I we traded studios and apartments with an, a Danish artist, Nina Sten Knudsen. So I was working in Nina's studio. And this is, a, I think, the last drawing, actually, that I did. It was in Tempelhof, on the edge of the Tempelhof field. Mm-hmm. So, so did you have... How did you construct this? Because you've got the landscape in the outside. Well, I, it's and interesting. Drawing, that and then, so how did you build the composition for this? Well, I was doing drawings where I was drawing. I was, I had a mirror set up on an easel. I was looking in the mirror. I was, there was a window behind me with all of Temple Hall Field. And it, I kept drawing everything in that I was looking at. And it took until I got to the last drawing where I just started jettisoning things. I got rid of the easel. I got rid of the edges of the mirror. I, I you know, you, you learn how to let go of stuff. And mm -hmm. so I let go of a lot of stuff. And I stopped worrying about whether the drawing explained itself. I just put into the drawing what I wanted. This, this period was very useful because my previous way of making pictures was to think of it as overloading the picture so that it would slow somebody down. They had to slow down to look at my work. And I developed a very different strategy during this time where I thought of only putting into the picture, either the drawing or the painting, what I absolutely needed to have there and to leave out all the kind of discursive detail that I love, but was hampering my work and, and weighing mm -hmm. the work down. Beautiful. So this was the first one that I did from life where I did a painting from life and it's small. It's about, I'm always bad at this. I think it's like 14 inches by 12 inches, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, these are oil on linen. Um, the mouse in this painting is a mouse that I made when I was from, when I was about in junior high, all the way through college, even at CalArts, I was making stuffed animals. Um, 
and I sold them when I was younger. I, I, in fact, I at first thought I would be a toy maker when I came out of high school. Oh, really? um, so this was a mouse that I made for a friend of mine somewhere around 67. And um, the mouse is coming to the studio to pay me a visit. So I also, I also was interested in oil paintings where the, you see layers of how the painting happens and the painting is in progress and you, it doesn't have to be a finished painting. The spaces don't have to be finished. The background in this painting is all done by, there's a dark layer of paint. And then I, when that was dry, I put a wet layer of this pale blue over it. And then I just scratched everything through with a, like with a needle. So mm. all the drawing you see is just me scratching through wet paint. And then what about the green? That's the um, fig tree that's out my outside the door of my studio. I have a big, I have a fig tree. It's not quite as exuberant as it is in the painting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you still are who you are, so you yes, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm really not interested in describing what things look like exactly. I'm right. interested in how they can take off from there. And in fact, when I was doing the drawings, one of the first things I had to really sort of let go of was the whole idea of portraiture. I, I'm not interested in worrying about whether the, the image I do of myself or Bob or other people look like them. I want to make a drawing or a painting that's more interesting to me on other levels. So um, I'm the last person you want to hire as a portrait painter probably. Well, but I do like, I do like how you've left, you know, like the body just kind of fades into this beautiful light and so does the, the head. So I, I, I thought all of that was going to be fleshed out, but yeah. there was a point where I had done what you see and I looked at it and I thought, oh, it's done. And yeah. I, I, I'm trying, I've been trying to leave more space for that in my work where the painting I really like the idea of a work of art being a conversation between me and the thing I'm making and the mm -hmm. thing I'm making has the space within which it can say to me, I'm finished, or I have another thing that we could go to or something. I, I and you realize it's kind of a romantic way to think about art making, thinking of the other thing having a voice, but I, but I like the idea of leaving that space. Mm -hmm. So the work in the studio is open-ended and more surprising and I can find something that maybe I didn't expect well and it makes the viewing as a viewer you know you get to bring really kind of bring yourself into it too and it yes. allows you to flush things out that's true I really do like that idea of leaving space for the viewer to interact with the painting mm -hmm. and figure out what their own relationship to it is yeah. I do love um there's a, a an interview with Larry Pittman that Helen Molesworth did once for a book on uh, on Larry's work in Skira. And, and Helen at one point says, um, Larry, there's this painting. It's got Pinocchios and credit cards and pearls coming out of assholes. And, you know, I, <laughs> and I can't make meaning out of it. Can you help me make some meaning out of this? And Larry said, I'm sorry, that's a service I don't provide. And I really, I really love that quote. I think that is really not, not because it's, funny and snotty no. <laughs> but but because it really gets to that dilemma I mean we as artists do our work and then I don't want to reduce the relationship the viewer has to a kind of here's the key to the painting way mm -hmm. I want them to enter if they want to I want them to enter into the work of art and start thinking about what it what it triggers for them or what they consider when they're looking at it or what's happening I don't want them to follow my path. I want them to find their own path. Yeah, because there there isn't one path. No. And also, you're the only one that has the relationship of maker to object. Everyone right. else is viewer. And you have to, and it puts the responsibility back onto the viewer, which is nice. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. This, Bob, um, Bob was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2008. Mm -hmm. And in uh, November 1st of 2017, he came down with sepsis and was taken to the hospital. He was in hospitals and rehab facilities until December 26th of 2017. And then I brought him home and cared for him at home and he died on May 20th of 2018. And 
you know, one, one of the really important experiences I had at CalArts is working with Arlene Raven, who I know you documented in the, the book, uh, show you did about the women's building. And Arlene was very important to me. And one of the things that Arlene really conveyed to all of us was she said, you need to tell us what it is like to be in your skin. You need to tell us what your experience is. The only way we can understand kind of the richness of human experience is if people speak honestly about what their experience is. And mm -hmm. so that's always been a part of my work, but it really came to the fore when Bob died, because then I had to, I, 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 had an agreement with PPOW that we were going to do a show and I'd agreed I was going to do at least 10 paintings. I ended up doing 18 paintings and I don't believe in artist therapy. And yet I had to be in the studio making these paintings. Right. Um, I just, I had to go through them. I, every year for our anniversary, I would make Bob a, um, a goat. Um, it, it's a long story, <laughs> no good here, but, but every year for our anniversary, I would make him a goat and they were silly drawings and they were funny and all sorts of things. So this was my last goat piece for Bob. This was, this was after he had died. This was called the goat for Bob Baruch. Oh, beautiful. And this one is called ghost and cavern. Um, I I had found a drawing in my notebooks from before Bob collapsed. Um, where, where in the in the drawing, I I'll show later on. I'll show one of the drawings I do often in the notebooks. They're very scribbly. I do things that are very very fast. I don't. My notebooks are never going to be one of those things where people look at them and admire how beautiful they are. <laughs> you know, they're really they're really. But but the scribbliness is part of it because it lets me get to something I want to try and get to and not spend a lot of time fussing with it. And in this drawing, Bob is this very erect Apollonian figure, which is mm -hmm. he, was, he was a rabbi, his, he had a doctorate in comp lit, and his thesis was on the Israeli poet Don Pagis. He also spoke four languages. I, you know, in this, in this drawing, Bob is like this very erect figure. He's speaking very calmly and I'm sort of hunched over like a gnome, you know, drawing. <laughs> and I have this big mouth open which is based on a doorway in Rome, a mannerist doorway where an entire like face becomes a, the mouth becomes a door. Mm -hmm. um, so I went back to that image when I did this painting. And when I did it, I thought that I would, this would be an underpainting of Bob and that I would come back and paint on top of it. But when I finished it, I thought, no, this is, this is, this is a, an approach to figuration I like where it's apparitional, where the, the thing seems to have somehow manifested itself. And it felt like Bob had suddenly kind of manifested himself in the studio and was visiting me. And he was, he was a voluble talker. He used his hands a lot when he talked the way, the way I did. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also all, a lot of the paintings take place in the studio. So you can sort of see the, the objects of the studio are laid out there. And, and then oh, I'm yeah, drawing in the, the back. You can see yeah. the images. Yeah. And then I'm drawing with a bamboo pen. Every time I appear, well, almost every time I appear in the in the paintings in this show, I am drawing. And sometimes I'm drawing Bob. Sometimes I'm trying to draw something else. But I'm always drawing, um, often with different tools and and different effectivenesses. In this case, the drawing of Bob is very kind of crude and simplified. Mm -hmm. With yeah, it does, it does the way he's kind of emerging in. It does have this as if he's appearing to you as a vision or something. Yeah, you know, the trying to take in as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. The you know the other thing that was interesting about doing these paintings. The painting of the goat that we just looked at is the mm -hmm. only one where there's a dark background. I was just running on instincts when I did these paintings, and when I would go into the studio, I would I would just spend time just layering a, a color onto a canvas until it looked like there was the color was ready to go and I, the colors were like bright red hot apricot delicate green they were really drenched colors and it was interesting because I realized this whole idea that when you're grieving that you're supposed to be in black or things are black or things like you know an absence of lighter color that was not my experience of grief. My experience of grief was that part of what made it sort of more intense 
was that the world doesn't go away. The world is very intense and it's around you all the time. And the person that you love is not there. And yet the world is very much there. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I hadn't thought that through until I was you know, in the middle of all this work, but I trusted that. And, and so the paintings have for the most part, very, very intense color relationships. Um, the colors kind of became the marching orders and the color is very much, oh, I love this picture. This is my, this is my eight-year-old <laughs> grandson, Avery, who is the only, I have three grandsons. Avery's the only one who's old enough to remember Bob. Mm. And so he and my daughter, Susie, our daughter, Susie, came with me to the opening in New York. And this is Avery looking at, at Ghost and Cavern, looking at Bob. That's I love beautiful. that picture. Yeah. It's also nice because the dark suit pops the colors. So what you're talking about. <laughs> good, <laughs> good boy. Color. Good boy. <laughs> yeah. He's great. <laughs> Well-trained grandson. <laughs> yeah. And we just had a message from Virginia Katz who says, your narrative on Bob is so sensitive and moving. I was remembering this morning his death and the beautiful gift of love you and your family and friends gave him towards the end. Yeah, it was... But it was an amazing experience having him home and yeah. and taking him through that because people came we had he was he was doing um he was studying clarinet which he loved playing with a young player and angelo quayle and angelo and his then girlfriend brought her harp and his clarinet into the tiny room where bob was and played for him Adam Gilbert, who's the head of early music at USC, brought over a whole lot of instruments and played them for Bob. And they had this big talk about what he was playing. It was it was really it was wonderful because it was um, Bob got to spend his last days being intensely involved with people and music and books and all the things he loved. It was really lovely. Well, it sounds like you helped create a, a beautiful experience for his end. It was it was important. This one's called Cry Baby. Um, so it's me drawing and then streams of tears coming, like in Alice in Wonderland, where she cries so much that she makes a pool of tears that she ends up swimming in. So, and then down below, there's an image of my hands drawing in the notebook with multiple images of Bob. And the knot, the, the knot that was in the basement of me in the ghost and cavern now reappears as kind of my brain in the in the. Mm -hmm. Painting. This is the one with the hot apricot background. This was really fun to paint. <laughs> I bet. It was really fun to make all these paintings about grief. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, it was highly distracting. What can I say? It was really uh, to go into your studio and think, well, there's a hot apricot painting and you can't just put flesh on top of hot apricot. It just goes away. So you have to completely rethink how you paint flesh. It was very fun. It was, it, it really helped me to have a balance while I was going through all this. Well, and it still maintains your bright color palette. I know because I know you've spent time in India. Yeah. And yeah, the, the color palette. different theater groups there. And yeah. Well, and the color palette really comes out of Indian painting. I really right. have sat at the knee of Indian painters, as it were, and learned about color from them. Um, yeah. Color in Indian painting is emotional for the most part. I mean, it's sometimes it's like in Pahari painting, it can be more realistic, but in a lot of Rajput painting, it's it's very emotional and expressive. And that really, you know, I've looked at tons of Indian painting, which I just love, and it really has kind of filtered into my thinking a lot. This one's called Trauerarbeit. Um, that's a German word that means grief work. And I was reading Bob's thesis on Bob on Don Pagis, and I found that word in it. And I thought, well, that's a perfect word for what I'm doing. So it's me. I'm doing a drawing of my studio cat, Nina, who I lost the year after I lost Bob. Nina was wow. absolutely a wonderful cat. He was such a sweetheart. So he's in the studio, and I'm drawing him. Behind me on the wall is a pair of scissors and then a, a Paul Clay drawing of an angel. And then Bob is drifting down into my head. Mm. And I had done, go to the next image. Yep. Slide, please. Um, <laughs> 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 this, I had done drawings before Bob collapsed. I was doing all these, this is, 
when I was doing the drawings from life, eventually the drawings moved more and more from just strictly, you know, me drawing what's in the mirror to more and more fantastic things. I'm kind of hardwired for fantasy on some level. And so in these drawings that I was doing, Bob was upside down and sort of drifting into my head. I just, you know, what can I say? It was a marriage, you know, yeah. <laughs> in my thinking a lot. So this was stuff that, that in some cases I had explored before Bob and I knew that, you know, we would be going through what we went through. Mm -hmm. um, I think this one's called Pedestal. It's, mm -hmm. it's ink on paper. So would you consider this a complete drawing? Is yeah, a, it's a complete yeah. drawing. It's, you know, it's hard to see it. I, I, yeah. one of the things that I really love, but I know can be frustrating when you're doing a talk like this is I love the idea of something being very delicate and you have to get right up to the drawing to see it, you right. know? Um, so is this, more, is this an ink or is this pencil or? No, it's all ink, it's all ink. Okay. And it, I, I really love working with ink, partly because um, it makes me so nervous because I, <laughs> I, I, I don't do a drawing ahead of time in pencil. I just start drawing with the ink and wherever the, the drawing goes is where it goes. Um, Beautiful. This is a close up of the, my head. And so I, it, like with something like this, I would start the the green layer you see in the back is me kind of sketching out where I am and then the blue layer with my eyes is like an underpainting that is across the entire face and then the last thing I did was to do overpainting. I like the idea of using that kind of classical figurative oil paint language of underpainting and overpainting to actually let some other kind of meaning come into the painting. Well and it creates such a vibrancy. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It, it, there's like layers of apparitions, as it were. I love the softness of, of this painting. It's, yeah, it's a very, it's interesting. There were a couple of paintings where the, the challenge was to make as pale a color as I could make, but a color that still had a throb to it. So I wanted a pale, pale pink. And there's another one, I don't know if I put it in the PowerPoint, but another one that's pale, pale green and one that's pale butter yellow. And they were all just as much fun to make as the hot apricots and deep red paintings. Well, and I love the the contrast because the cat and the jars and the brushes are so real, right? They're so strong. Mm -hmm. And then you're in this like blissful thinking space. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice way to that's a nice way to describe it, actually. This one's called Jonah. Um, Bob, as I said, was a rabbi, and a lot of the paintings ended up circling around stories from the Hebrew Bible. Um, Robert Alter had, right after Bob died, about a year after Bob died, Robert Alter had been working on a, the first complete translation of the Hebrew Bible by one hand. He's been doing it for years, but he finally had completed it, and so I had got that, and I was reading parts of it. And Bob used to, on Yom Kippur Day, he would go to Beth Haim Padashim, which is the temple that we belong to and that I still belong to. And um, on Yom Kippur Day, he would often do a talk about, about Jonah. And, you know, when you're in your life, things, and then the person is gone, there are things afterwards you just kick yourself from missing. And I, you know, and I never went to Bob's talk on Jonah. I would drop him off in the morning. I'd come back later in the day when they do the reading of the names. So I never heard his talk on Jonah. And when I read the book, finally, it is really this amazing text that's kind of like a folk tale and a poem and a song. And it's all this stuff about the ineffable and trying to escape your fate. And I couldn't talk to Bob about it. So I decided to make a painting about it. And so in the painting, I'm in this boat, I'm drawing, I'm just drawing this like swirling motion. And then Bob is being carried down by this fish who looks one way above the water, but in very much another way below the water. And he's being carried down to this world of kind of these, you know, weird personality-less huge-eyed creatures. It's gorgeous. Thank you. This one is called Threnody. Threnody is a song of mourning. It's um, my right hand. When I was making the painting, I wanted this magenta background. I had to layer it a lot. And then I had all these different sort of versions of the hand. So every layer of paint I'd put down somewhere in the painting, I would write, I couldn't save them. 
And I just kept building that and building that and building that so that it just keeps saying, I couldn't save him. I couldn't save him. I couldn't save him. Um, it's, it's interesting. I'm now, the guy who I'm seeing now, a lovely guy, he lost his husband of 37 years, two years ago. Mm. And at one point, um, I can't remember what happened, but something happened where I sent him several images of my work. <laughs> I sent him this and he was at work and he said, he opened the file, he looked at the painting, he went over and shut the door of his office and just you know, <laughs> like, started wailing because they, that's so much a part of grief, I think, is afterwards, especially if you've been doing caretaking, you just think, if I turn left instead of right, they would still be alive. If I'd done this instead of that, they would still be, you know, Joan Didion described it so beautifully in the year of magical thinking. You just, you just, it takes a long time to pry yourself loose from the belief that you could have saved them. Yeah. Well, the, the exhibition I'm working on right now of Keith Cuccinelli's work, right. um, he actually, we were, it was a whole long story, but I ended up having to perform CPR yeah. He had collapsed and, and it was just, I got him to the hospital yeah. Um, and then he passed, but it was still, I remember saying these exact words to his family, yeah. you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's, it is that, but it was his time to go, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's very powerful. So this is also like underpainting and overpainting the, the green is the underpainting and then the thumb is overpainted. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. <laughs> this, one, <laughs> yeah. this, this one's called Kaddish. Um, Kaddish is the Jewish prayer of mourning. The, uh, it, it's not exactly the right way to describe it. It's something, it's something you say when you go to visit somebody's grave or when you come to the end of the Shabbat service and you're thinking about people. In, in, you know, in Judaism, part of what I love in Judaism is there is not this concern with an afterlife. I mean... There's some ideas about Jewish ideas of an afterlife, but it's not a primary concern. The main thing in Judaism is, is remembrance, is the power of remembering who people were and, and keeping their names alive. And Kaddish is part of that. So for the year after Bob died, I said Kaddish every morning. Mm. And then for the next couple of years, I said it every Friday. And I still say it, you know, when I go to temple and so forth. So in the painting, I'm sort of walking along and making X marks in my notebook. It's like, I just, you know, I can't even be bothered to do drawings. I'm just making marks. And Bob is up in these branches. He's wearing his kippah, his, his cap, and he's wearing his talit, the shawl, and sort of, you know, trying to, trying to communicate with me. And these are painted, the, like the painting of me is done in a way that sometimes I found very helpful where I just, I, you know, at Cal Arts, I wasn't trained in how to do figure painting. I kind of had to figure the language out for myself by looking at other people I loved and talking to friends who were already painting the, in oil paint. And one of the ways I found into representations was to just smear the oil paint on and then start pulling it out with a, a, a brush loaded with turpentine and just sort of go backwards and forwards so that it was kind of like trying to catch something that would suddenly appear in the paint. And that's very much how, how I'm painted in this painting, is using that. This one's called My Rabbi. Um, it's a small painting. It's the only one that really functions like a portrait. Um, it's a Bob. He's, I was, I, I'm giving this painting to my daughter and I was writing her about it. And I said something that I just realized, which I exaggerated. Bob had terrible eyesight. And so he wore these unbelievably thick eyeglasses. And I just realized as I was writing her, I knew I'd made the eyeglasses kind of rhyme with his kippah. They're sort of uh -huh. the same dome shape. But as I was writing to her, I realized it's like a way of saying how Bob saw the entire world through his faith, which he did. He saw, he, he really saw his life and the world through the lens of Judaism and his faith. And then I think the next image is um, a, the working drawing for this, which is, which is somewhat different. So this is, I, I don't, I've been trying not to do working drawings as much as I can with the paintings, but in this case, I really wanted to make sure I got Bob. Yeah. And the drawing 
to me. I kept, I'm keeping the drawing, I'm giving the painting to Susie. The drawing is sort of, the drawing is more the Bob I knew and loved. The painting is more about what was happening at the end, because at the end, Bob's body was kind of feeding on itself the way that, you know, happens when you're dying, you know, that you gradually are, you know, you're consuming, you know, your flesh, as it were. So you can see the, the skull much more, you can see the veins, you know, it, it, the painting is sort of a harder representation. The drawing is more the guy, the guy I lived with. And your choice to keep the ear fleshy, well, is that because all, like hearing is one of the last things to go? No, it wasn't. I mean, that that's true. That is true. And I, I hadn't thought of that, but that is not part of it. I think the ear is a very sexy organ. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought it's, I thought it's the most improbable thing stuck onto the sides of our heads. Here we have this head and on the side of our heads, we have this incredibly sexy, fleshy thing. It was, wow. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, what's it doing there? You know? And so I, I, I love ears. I love that. And, and Bob was very sexy to me. I mean, he was sexy all the way to the end. I thought he was just really handsome. And so I like the idea of there being this kind of entry, you know, in a way, mm -hmm. but also Bob was very connected to, he, his first degree was in music. He loved music, um, classical music, not pop music. He's the only guy I know who was our age who went through the sixties without a Beatle record. <laughs> and there was one time, there was one time we were driving along and all the radio, we're on the long drive and all the radio stations had dropped out. And I thought, well, I'm going to put on Joni Mitchell's Hajira because that's a really interesting, complex record. And maybe he'll like that. So I put it on the CD player and we drive along for a while. And then finally, Bob says, and totally non-ironically says, and maybe after a while we could listen to some music. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he really, he loved classical music. And as I said, he spoke four languages. So yeah listening was important for him. This is sort of the, the book end to the first goat painting. This one's called Had God Ya. Had God Ya, as Bob explained to me when we first got together, is a song that we sing at Passover about one little goat. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the end, I wanted to go back and I wanted to use a palette that came out of Persian painting. It's more silvery and golden than it is the bright, intense colors of Indian painting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I wanted something that the, the brick wall, I didn't think about this when I first thought about the painting, but as I made the painting, I thought about the brick wall being this kind of process. It is analogous to what I went through in making the show and in the years after Bob died, where you just mm -hmm. kind of piece by piece, you're just working through all this stuff and putting it together. I, I don't know how to explain. And when I painted it, I was recovering myself from surgery and I would come out here to the studio and it was great. It was just like, paint a brick, paint a brick, paint a brick. Yeah. Paint a brick. <laughs> so after I finished the last painting about Bob, um, it was interesting. It was I'd been thinking for some time about hares and how much I loved hares. Hares as opposed to rabbits. Rabbits are more domestic. They're, they're mm -hmm. usually smaller, they're rounder, their ears are shorter, they're, they're bred to be more passive. Hares are wild. They are rangier, they're longer, they're leaner, they have longer snouts, they're bigger ears, and, they're, and as a friend of mine said, they're the most high-strung animal you can imagine because they are scanning the horizon and the sky and everything for predators all the time right and i i never pick the animals in my work because they're symbolic they're not i just pick them because i'm fascinated with what they are and who they are and and it feels like it's like a fertile territory to go into to explore and within a week i started drawing hairs and was just off to the races i was just having so much fun drawing them so this is a graphite drawing of a hare cleaning its foot by the edge of a grave. Mm. When I first saw this image, before I realized it was graphite, I was thinking it was your silver point because you did so many beautiful. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple point. silver points in here. 
Yeah, that, that, that was the other thing. I, I, I love drawing in a wide range of mediums. I love different mediums feel like they're different syntaxes. I can't speak different languages. I, I was mm -hmm. always jealous of Bob being able to speak so many languages. I have never been able to learn how to be fluent in another language. But for me, material is like language. And so switching from graphite to pastel to silver point to ink is like being able to shift syntax. This is another graphite drawing, um, a hair and a birch wood. Um, the broken tree. The broken tree. So uh, Marcy Beglider was asking if you've ever worked with moving images. You know, I haven't. It's interesting. I, you know, <laughs> the list of what I haven't done is greater than the list of what I, I a lot of times <laughs> things like moving images or theater or things like that, things that I love are things I plow into my visual art rather than trying to do the other thing. I, I, that's just my way of working. This is a lithograph that I did recently with the Hamilton Press. I did three lithographs of the hairs with them. This is, this is one of them. Um, and this is one of the silver points. Um, so my friend, I, I had not done silver point for a long time. And my friend, Jim Matthews, um, who's a wonderful jeweler had made me a silver point tool that was really just shockingly beautiful. So I made a silver point to thank him. And I had so much fun doing it again, that 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 kind of unlocked another whole area of language and silver point, you're drawing with a silver tool on a treated surface. So you're not leaving a material, you're chemically changing the surface that you're working on. And it was used a lot in the Renaissance. And it's a medium that produces this very beautiful kind of delicate surface and description. And is it something, uh, once you commit your line, you're committed, right? Um, well, actually- Can you, can you, you yes, back more, out? More or less it, you're committed, but you can erase and knock things back, but not really erase and take things out. And besides, it, I think with silver point and with ink, half the fun is just the kind of juggernaut of the, of the drawing that you just move mm -hmm. forward regardless. Yep. And so- to get involved with erasing and silver point or ink is kind of counterproductive. Right. Um, and then, I mean, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask your research for the, your visual research for constructing the hairs. I mean, I, well, <laughs> do you, I mean, <laughs> well, first of all, hairs don't look like this. <laughs> yes. No, but I mean, do you, you've obviously done some research. Oh, yeah. No, I have. I have. Gather. I have images I gather. What I do is I gather a lot of images. And then I try to often, I, this is where drawing in the notebooks comes in because I'll do a drawing in a notebook of what I want to see. And then when I'm looking at images, instead of finding an image and thinking, oh, here's a good image, I'll use this one. It's like, I'm getting information to make something that looks like what I sketched in the notebook. And that mm -hmm. keeps me on a better path um, right. think, in terms of not flattening out the image. Right. Because you are, you know, you, you're like the eyeball is really large and the, you know, you're yeah. doing distortion and changing shape, which conveys the emotion. I had, I had somebody recently bought one of the later drawings. I don't, I don't care if my, anyway, but, and um, it was suggested that they go look at the lithographs because they wanted to get one as a present for somebody. And they came back and told my dealer, those hairs are really scary. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, good. <laughs> uh, yes, there is an intensity about them. These, this is a series of drawings that began, I was in Berlin two years ago for about three and a half months. And um, I began a series of drawings there. I, I I learned enough German to be able to 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 glue words together in the way that Germans are fond of doing. So the title of this is Hassen. I'm gonna, yes, Hassen Blumen Mondkopf, um, Rabbit Moon Flower Head. <laughs> no, rabbit, <laughs> rabbit Flower Moon Head. So anyway, there were a series of drawings where it's my the bot like 
my chin, my shoulders, and then it just gets more and more elaborate. I would do these very fast drawings in a mirror, and then everything after that became more and more sort of feverish and elaborate. I think there's a couple of them here, are yeah. there? Yeah. Really? This is the first one. That's the second one. You know, I, I was doing, I was with my friend Will in Berlin. We were sharing a flat and Will at one point said, you always, you're not smiling in these drawings. And I think of you as smiling. Try smiling when you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like my mother saying, you know, you'd look much nicer in a photo if you smiled. So I, <laughs> so I started trying to smile when I did these. <laughs> Which got kind of alarming. <laughs> this one almost looks like you're singing. <laughs> I know, I know. So, that's fabulous this this is this is silver point in graphite um it's from a series of drawings i did called seculum a seculum is the amount of time that something still exists in the memory of people who are living and mm. so in the drawings i kind of scattered the images of the hairs and my hands and so forth all around the edges of the paper so that they were sort of dispersed and dispersing. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. And this one is, um, this one's about, I think about 18 inches tall. Um, I did a couple drawings of thinking about, you know, there's a way that people when they're hunting hares, you know, they do this terrible thing where they hold them by the ears, which is, you know, I guess convenient for the hunter, but is very painful for the animal. But I did a couple of drawings of hairs that appear to be held up somehow, and this is one of them. And you said this was graphite? No, this is silver point. point. Is okay. Point. I have these beautiful papers that my friend Paul Singdalson made for me um, that are in very delicate colors. So I've been using those to work on. And is this a white or is it? It's it's a, this is, a, you know, a lot of these are my, like me shooting photos with yeah. my cell phone in the studio. So this is like a very pale pink paper, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Apologies for the photographs. They're no very, worries. <laughs> they're very funky sometimes. It's nice to be able to see the imagery. This one's called translation. This is graphite. Mm -hmm. I like also working on different kinds of papers. I have a flat file filled with paper I've been accumulating for years and I love going into the flat file and finding something that triggers a sense that that is somehow analogous to the sensation I want to try and describe so a lot of a lot of handmade papers that I've collected and this uh, this is <laughs> this is the drawing that the person collected that then they thought my other hairs were too scary <laughs> this, one, this, one, this one's called rabbit in the rain or hair and hair in the rain, excuse me, okay. hair in the rain. Um, and these are, this is, um, this is black pastel. And um, how big is it, you think? I'm sorry? How big? What's the scale? Um, it's about maybe 20 inches tall mm -hmm. or so by about probably 10 or 10 inches wide or so. I love when I work with black pastel pencil, what I love is I, I, I sharpen, I've like dozens of them and I sharpen them all. And then when I draw, I'm drawing with a very precise line. So it's not pastel where it's smudged or anything. It's a very, very precise way of drawing. Um, but, but the pastel has a warmth to it that's really lovely. So that when you, when you build up the surfaces, you get a really nice throbbing kind of surface from the pastel pencil. Well, and it's so beautiful. You've got the rain coming down, but then the bottom feels like it pops up, which yeah. is so nice when you watch a rainstorm. Yeah, yeah. Really captured that. This is one of the more recent ones. This is um, the hair in the birch wood. And I, the, the, when I was in Germany, both last year and then the year before, I would go on train trips to other cities. And you drive past these wonderful birch forests. And the flicker of those forests is so beautiful, just going past the train window. And I wanted to do drawings where I somehow caught something about how that felt. And I, I became interested in the idea of the birches almost being like pistons that are spinning and throbbing and going up and down while the hairs run through them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it does almost feel like the trees are moving more than yeah. the, than the rav the hairs. Yeah. <laughs> And this is this gives you an idea. This is one of the notebook drawings. So, so as you can see, I do something. It's very crude, but it just gives me a sense of what I want the motion to be, or where I want the energy to be, or you know, I'm I'm trying to do something that then I can build on in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about. I want compression. I want movement. I want you know. And then when I'm looking for images. I'm not just sort of going in looking for an image thinking, oh, I need a hair running. Oh, there's a hair running. I'll do that. And so I'm sort of taking many images and gluing them all together in my drawing to get them to do what I want. So that, that gives you a sense of how we end up with the drawing like this. Mm -hmm. And this is one called translation. Um, it's me in the, the wood with the hairs. So have you shown these? No, these are for a show probably at Mark Selwyn, um, oh, who's nice. my dealer here in LA. I don't know when, but at some point we'll be showing these. So, but Some of the earlier ones were shown at PPOW, but, but these are all, you know, um, later. Um, this is one called After Tenniel. Um, Tenniel was the illustrator for Alice in Wonderland, mm -hmm. which was my favorite book growing up and is still probably one of my favorite books. So the, this hare who has human hands and feet is drawing the griffin that's in, in Alice in Wonderland. Gorgeous. Um, someone has asked how many catalogs of your work have been published? They find it hard to find any. Well, there's one very beautiful little catalog. Meg did the first catalog of my work at, at, for a show at the Santa Barbara Contemporary Arts Forum. Yeah, that's when we found out producing little CD booklets were really affordable. So uh -huh. we did a really nice little one. It was brilliant. That was a brilliant. Yeah. There and is then you and Ann Ayers did that beautiful one yeah that's that's the only real elaborate catalog and that was published in around 2000 mm -hmm. so um you can find that online I don't know if the fellows still have it the fellow the fellows a contemporary who published it kind of cleaned out all their catalogs a while ago but I think you can find it online and if you can't find it online contact me I'll give you the, I'll give you one <laughs> I have boxes of them <laughs> that's great so. yeah it's you're you're overdue well another book okay <laughs> <laughs> this is one called um a griffin griffin mm -hmm. it's a it's an it's an elderly nearsighted griffin who's molting and he's drawing the griffin out of alice in wonderland and this is one called fabulous monsters which is um there's a wonderful sequence in Through the Looking Glass where Alice meets the lion and the unicorn and the, the lion who's nearsighted is peering at Alice and going, are you a fabulous monster? You know? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't recognize her. So this is the Griffin and I as fabulous monsters. And I'm I'm drawing a, a, a like a medieval image of a griffin. And uh -huh. The griffin is molting. And, and that's it. That yeah. was our last image. That's our last image. Wow. Does anybody have any other questions for Tom? Everyone just says thank you. Well, thank um, you. Let's, let's see. As a former academic who taught art, surely you encountered the debate about illustration versus art. I taught at, at Art Center. I taught both in illustration and fine art, mm -hmm. and, which I, I love doing. Um, mm -hmm. I, the way I often, the students would say, well, what's the difference between illustration and fine art? And I would say, well, an illustration is an image that is designed to carry a text or to amplify a text or something like that. And a, a work of fine art is designed to ask questions. It's designed to open things up. So oh, that was how I always explained it. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much. This has been thank wonderful. You. Thank you. My and pleasure. I it's been very fun.
Yeah, this has been terrific. And um, I just want to let everyone know we will not be meeting on the first Friday of September. We'll be meeting on September 22nd because of how the semester schedule works at the BAC. And we'll be meeting with Catherine Fairbanks, who's a wonderful artist. And we're also, um, for October, we have Flora Cow, and we have Siri, the photographer Siri Carr coming up. So I hope you guys will sign up for the rest of the programs for the year. And thank you everybody for being with us. And Tom, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye everybody.